Well, this spring here goes to my muller and it broke on me last night. I have already done a repair on this once. You can see where I welded in some flat bar up under the bottom of it. I believe I used a lawnmower blade and I used some special rod to weld those. Luckily, I had another spring uh, spare that I already did the same repair to and I put it in last night. So uh, that's just one of the things you have to steadily fix around here. This spring has a hole in the middle and there's a little pilot tip on the end of this bolt that needs to align with it. I forgot to do that last night. And honestly, I'm wondering if that's such a good idea. Because it weakens the spring, I think. You know what? I'm going to back off on that. I don't... Honestly, the spring's not going anywhere. It's going to stay right there in those stirrups. So I'm going to just keep this backed out. It's supposed to put tension on the spring, but I don't like all that pressure in that one single point. Now, if it evenly distributed it on a, another plate, it might be a good idea, but that might be one of the things causing me problems. Because that's where it always breaks. You can see that hole on the back side here when you turn it. Uh, yeah, right there. Not much, much of it left. But, uh, yeah, I think from here forward I'm not going to be pushing that bolt down there. That's not a, that's not a good, good design. Way too much stress in that one single area. And it pops it every time right there in the same place. As I get time, more time, what I may do is grind the ends down. Take like a quarter inch or a half inch off the end of the spring on each end. And make me a cast iron plate a half inch to go in there. Cast iron's not going to flex. It'll, it'll break like this. But I don't think a bar that's only going two inches long... Uh, it'd take a lot to break that. So that'll stabilize it pretty good. I got a wedge here, here, and here. So I'm going to mold some sand now and get this ready. So we're fixing to mold this now. I, I hated to do that to my mold board. We're going to have to go back in and fill those holes for the other job we use this particular flask for.
So this is the last of the bearing halves that we were pouring for Minnesota Streetcar Museum. We'll get those uh, degated, ground, and shipped probably tomorrow. I said I had enough to do one more set I know, and as you saw in the video on those first two molds, it took every drop. I was thinking we'd have another ingot left uh, to ship back with them, but it will just be the gates, sprues, and the risers. I apologize for not showing the molding of this uh, particular mold for Ray Fisher, but I'm probably going to try to do it next week. We were just running out of time. We got back from Iowa after about a four-day trip, so it left me very little time to throw a video together to get out. But next week, I will plan. I, we're going to have to have two of these anyway, so I should have enough time to get the molding part of this on the next video. So this particular flask was a good bit longer, and I was not going to be able to lift it up with my trusty crane skid. So I had to tie a uh, choker around it to get it in here. Now i got to get this off. May as well take this clamp off too. And this is a uh, casting we're doing for Ray Fisher. We got to do one more after this, but I wanted to verify the casting turned out before we go any farther. So let's find out right now. bit of flashing but it looks like we got one oh yeah yep I'll clean that up and I'll show you give you a little better view of it and we're gonna cut the gates after we weigh this we're going to, have to determine how much more metal we need uh, and go from there. I think we're going to be short trying to pour a second one because we don't have but probably a couple pounds other than the gates on this. So um, uh, I guess uh, we're going to have to call the customer and let him know that and see what he wants to add to it. Well, guys, this is it. Uh, we're got, we have to make one more of these. And we are currently, we ran out of material. I'm waiting on Ray to reply to let me know what he wants to do we i think we're missing let's see we need an additional 10 pounds it looks like in order to pull off the next casting uh i'm gonna have to take a look and see what i have in stock it would be good to keep the material the same for the other one if possible if not we're gonna have to to do some some other things but anyway this is the front or the back and then this is the this is probably the back because it looks like it's supporting something else up under here and uh, it weighs a little more than the cast iron one but anyway uh, it's, I didn't show the molding process I'll tell you what I might try to fit that in next week we'll see
videoed him wish uh, a jinx him. Oh, he got that. Now. So that was Josie with her father and uncle bowling, having a good time. They had a family reunion in Iowa, so I went up with her, and Dollar got to enjoy some pretty fall colors, along with climb some mountains. She thought she was a mountain goat. So the next photo I'm fixing to show you is of an old blacksmith shop, which is right beside where they had their family reunion. And I'm pretty sure you guys would be like me and want to spend hours in this thing plundering. Hey guys, I'm with my buddy Steve McKinley, and uh, Steve is a car collector. He has a lot of cool, old, unique uh, works of art in here. That's what I call them. And behind us is a... Things in mint condition. And go ahead and tell us what, what year this is. Uh, 31. 1931, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Everything is original except for the battery charger. The booster there. Yeah, This thing's got a, a metal yep. bed in it. Yeah, they had that option back then? I believe so. Yep. 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 Huh. It's got the wood, wood side, the stake side bed. Yeah. Uh -huh. But anyway, guys, uh, I've got another video I have failed to get out there yet uh, of Steve's collection. And uh, it's I'm going to have to get that out soon. You guys need to see this stuff. Well, I'm not going to just... Why don't we take them over and show them what we're... What oh, we're yeah. I'm just wrapping up here. Again. All right. Okay. But anyway, this is this is one example of some of the many interesting things Steve has out here in the shop. So this is a 1937 cord. He's been working on for five years. Yep. All that's left is to put the hood back on it now. This, this past September was five years. Yeah. We were, uh, we were up... Uh, earlier this year uh -huh. and he had it almost together the doors the fenders all that were were just he had just gotten gotten everything painted mm -hmm. and but they weren't mounted yet mm -hmm. so he's got everything back together except for the hood and this is the supercharged model this isn't the uh, the plain Jane one of the unique things about this car was that the dashboard was designed after a, an airplane instrument panel. Yeah. And it one of the it, it came standard with a radio, which was highly unusual in those days. But this is the the radio dials here, and then <clears throat> you had uh, your clock and your oil pressure, um, your t uh, tachometer, your speedometer, and then your fuel gauge. There's a little button down here, and if you push this little fuel gauge here button under the fuel gauge, it would check the oil in the in the engine. And really? Check, yeah, there's a float in the oil in the oil pan. So if you push that button in, it would, it would show you what the level of your oil was in the engine. Of all the things mm -hmm. they uh, dropped over the years that they should have utilized as a standard feature. Mm -hmm. Then it has this unique shifting. This is how you shift the car with this device here. You pre-select the gear you want to go into. So if I wanted to go into first gear, I got to get there. And then once I once I select, put it in the selected position, then I have to step on the clutch. And when the clutch depresses, then it, it shifts falls into it, that it, gear. It shifts automatically into those gears. Huh. So <clears throat> they were all synchro mesh except for first and reverse. So mm -hmm. um, you didn't want to try it in those yeah. gears, but uh, but it was a fun car to drive. When you bought the car you, you, from the factory direct, they would offer you a certificate 
where it had been test driven through a plowed field at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> and this is the first front wheel drive car in America. This yeah. is a front wheel drive. Um, now it's, has concealed headlights. It had a lot of things that people in the 60s were saying, oh, that's new, that's new. Well, Cord had it back in the 30s. So, And Steve's father, uh, Steve, I'm going to let you tell this or I'll <laughs> mess it up. But uh, Steve's father, uh, after the Cord went out of business, mm -hmm. your father bought, bought the business, the right? right. Mm -hmm. Him and, and another fellow. Yeah. Together so, they went in. And they started remaking the cord in the, in the early 60s, 64, 65. Mm -hmm. That was the, the rebirth of the cord 810, they called it, because it was eight tenths the size of the original one. Mm -hmm. So, And I, that's one of those is in the back. Yeah. And mm -hmm. in the other video I show you, we'll, I'll show you more on that, along with the, uh, the other treasures he has out here. Okay. But anyway, guys, I just wanted to introduce you to Steve. Steve's been out to my house several times now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, matter of fact, I hope he'll be back out again soon. But, <laughs> yeah. But I just wanted to show you a little taste of some of the things he has out here. And this uh, other video uh, will do more justice when, once I get it compiled and get it together. Yeah, well, whenever you can. I know you're the busiest guy I know right now. I don't know anybody's. <laughs> got more on their plate than you do. I don't know. When I look around here and see everything you've yeah, got but I'm going on. Nobody's pushing me. I can go at yeah. my own pace. I don't have to. I only answer to me. I don't have people yeah. you know, <laughs> saying, hey, when am I going to get this? <laughs> so, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I wouldn't trade places for anything. No. That's, uh, yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> so long. Well, guys, the day after we got home, uh, Steven supplied me a picture of the car all put together. Hood's on it, and it's ready to roll. He said he's already drove it around the block a few times. Beautiful looking car, though. Just wanted to share it. Mr. Ken McConnell had made me some patterns to cast of what I'm showing you here in bronze back last month for the Houston Flywheelers, and they turned out great. And not only that, a lot of people wanted them. So we decided to go ahead and make the same thing, except so it says Sule Steam Feed Works 2023. And we're going to try to get some of these cast up through the month as we do other things and try to have some of these available for the Steam Festival next month. So Ken has been one of Keith's go-to people for pattern making. Uh, pattern, Keith's kind of like me. He just doesn't have time to do everything. And Ken does a good quality job. I'm very happy with everything we've used of his. Ken owns Flat Squirrel Solutions, which is into 3D printing, casting patterns. I'm assuming that's uh, like making resin molds and stuff like that. And reverse engineering and design. But anyway, if you, if you would like to... Uh, Look into getting Ken to do anything for you. His email is flatsquirrelsolutions at gmail.com. Ken wasted no time getting on this and getting it to me. As a matter of fact, I contacted him right before we left, and these came in while we were gone. So <laughs> uh, luckily, nobody got them before I could get back to them. So someone pointed out the little blue shovel here. That is Josie's work area. And that's Josie's little blue shovel. <laughs> Not mine. Uh, she uses that to shovel the Petrobon out of our wheelbarrow. It works great for that. So we don't need a big scoop for that part of it. So anyway, now you know. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't even realize that thing was in the video until several people commented on it. Before I let you go, we are going to be listing aluminum anvils like the jeweler's anvil that's in bronze. We're going to list aluminum ones on our website for $25 a piece plus shipping. I think that's eight bucks, eight ten. So it'd be, what, $32 and 10 cents to the women out there. If you want to buy your husband or your boyfriend something to go in his man cave or on their desk, or if you're a woman that's interested in anvils and you want one and you don't want to pay a lot, 
we're trying to make them as affordable as possible. We have pretty much mastered the anvils to where we can crank out so many a week and it not interfere with the other work. So if you're interested in one or two, uh, they will be listed as of tonight on my website. But anyway, <clears throat> um, I hope you all have a good week and I will talk to you later. For those who have been asking about the Windy Hill Foundry hats, these are now available on my website, windyhillfoundry.com, under stores, or you can click on the above link. These are on the pricey side, but keep in mind the shipping is included. Have a good day.